an authentic account of all the proceedings on the fourth of july eighteen fifteen with regard to laying the cornerstone of the washington monument now erecting in the city of baltimore printed and published by john horace pratt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Agreeably to previous arrangements, the managers of the monument met in Howard's Park at 12 o'clock on Tuesday, the 4th of July, 1815, and in the presence of from 25 to 30,000 of their fellow citizens, among whom were a number of the reverend clergy, the president and members of the Cincinnati of Maryland, His Excellency the Governor, right worthy grand master and members of the grand lodge of maryland and the subordinate lodges of baltimore the mayor and city council of baltimore officers of the army and navy major general r g harper and aides and the third brigade of maryland militia under the command of brigadier general sterrett they proceeded to perform the pleasing duty assigned to them by the legislature of maryland of laying the first cornerstone of a monument to be erected in the city of baltimore to the memory of General Washington, the father of the Republic. In an elevated situation near the spot prepared for laying the cornerstone was exhibited an excellent likeness of the deceased hero and sage, an original portrait painted by Mr. Rembrandt Peel, and, immediately under the picture, a correct and beautiful representation of the monument to be erected, as designed by Mr. Mills, painted by Mr. Henry Warren. These were richly decorated by Mr. Hugh Findlay, forming, together, an appropriate trophy for the occasion, and at the beginning of the ceremony, the ensigns from the attending volunteer corps displayed their flags, on which were painted the arms of the United States, around the trophy. The ceremonies of the day were commenced by some national airs from a volunteer band of amateurs, Mr. Bunny, leader. A salute of thirty-nine guns, commemorative of the number of years which was on that day completed since the Declaration of Independence, Washington's March by the Band. James A. Buchanan, Esquire, President of the Board of Managers, then addressed the audience as follows. The distinguished honor, my fellow citizens, of presiding on this interesting occasions has devolved upon me, in consequence of the death of my predecessor, the founder and first president of the Board of Managers, John Cummings, to whom, more than to any member of the Board, more, indeed, than to all the other members of the Board, is to be ascribed whatever there may be of merit in the procuring for our city the glory of being the first to erect a monument of gratitude to the father and benefactor of our country and my fellow citizens is it not with peculiar propriety that this first expression of national gratitude should be made in the city of baltimore at all times the first to evince its attachment to those republican institutions to secure which was the great object of washington's labors Baltimore has at no time been backward with testimonials of her love and gratitude towards him. When she saw him elevated to the highest honors in the gift of his country, Baltimore was among the first to approach him with her homage. The tokens of regard and affection, said he, which I have often received from the citizens of this town were always acceptable, because I always believed them sincere. When, descending from his exalted station, he relinquished his power and sought for happiness in the bosom of retirement, the first to thank him for his services and to regret his departure was baltimore in reply to an address presented to him on that occasion by the city he observed i pray you to accept of my sincere thanks for the evidence you have now given of approbation of my past services for those regrets which you have expressed on the occasion of my retirement to private life and for the affectionate attachment which you have declared for my person if these be sufficient to establish, in Baltimore, a priority of claim to the hallowed services of this day, recent interesting events of which she was the theater lean powerfully in support of them. During the war in which we have been engaged, the city, destined to bear the proud name of Washington to future ages, fell an easy conquest to the ruthless invader. The shock produced by this stroke was felt from the one end of these United States to the other. The minds of our countrymen appeared to be transfixed with horror and dismay. A night of awful darkness seemed to overshadow our land. The gloomiest apprehensions were entertained for the Republic. The timid and the desponding, 
not recollecting that freedom rises with an elasticity proportionate to the pressure made upon it, were approaching a state of political despair. At this most awful moment for our country, Baltimore, the city of our affection, in which was contained our altars, our families, our all, became the next object of attack to a vindictive, and at that time a vainglorious foe. The eyes of all America were fixed upon us. On the destiny of Baltimore seemed to be suspended the fate of the Republic. She breasted the storm, and thanks to her gallant defenders, exists now, in prosperity and glory, to perform her most grateful of duties. The desire, my fellow citizens, of perpetuating the memory of illustrious men has prevailed in every age of the world. The ingenuity of men has been exercised, as well in his rudest, as in his most polished condition, in devising methods by which effectually to gratify this desire. The song of the poet, the pen of the historian, the pencil of the painter, the chisel of the sculptor, all have, in every age, been employed to render their fame imperishable. It has, indeed, been sometimes said that the only monument real excellence requires is an existence in the recollection of those who have been blessed by its operation, and that in the gratitude of prosperity it has its best reward. It would be superfluous, under present circumstances, to inquire into the correctness or incorrectness of this sentiment. We have taken the sense of mankind as exhibited in immemorial usage for our guide, and I therefore proceed to state that we are assembled here, my fellow citizens, to lay the cornerstone of a monument intended to commemorate the virtues of our great Washington, of the hero and the sage who was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. On an occasion so grand, so interesting, it might perhaps be expected that some notice should be taken of the services of the mighty dead, but when we recollect that the world is filled with his glory, and that its radiance shines with a luster which requires no aid from eulogy, I feel relieved from a task which it would have been the height of presumption for me to have undertaken. With these few observations, my fellow citizens, more than which I have not believed to be necessary, and less than which would not have satisfied my own impressions of duty, allow me to solicit your devout attention to the next feature of our arrangement, which is to invoke the blessings of Almighty God on the purpose for which we are assembled. The following prayer was then addressed to the throne of God by the Right Reverend Bishop Kemp. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, every good thing that we enjoy here we derive from Thee, and every good thing that we hope for thereafter Thou alone canst bestow. We acknowledge with deep humility that we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts, that we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and that we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and that there is no spiritual health in us. Pardon, O merciful Father, our manifold transgressions. Purify our hearts from every defilement, and grant us grace to enable us to devote our hearts and our lives more particularly to thy service. We magnify and adore thee, the supreme ruler of nations, for the many and distinguished blessings which we enjoy as a people, for the liberty, prosperity, and happiness which we have derived from that memorable act whose anniversary has again rolled round. On this day let every heart expand with gratitude and joy. Let it be distinguished by our citizens as a commencement of a new era in the history of nations, when a great and extensive empire rose into existence, when a supreme being opened a way for the rapid dissemination of liberty, learning, and religion over an uncultivated wilderness, ameliorating the condition of man, and spreading light and salvation through a wide extended land. O oh God, for these blessings, give us grace to be duly thankful. In particular we come before thee at this time to implore a blessing on our present undertaking, and that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, may perpetuate and extend those principles upon which depend our happiness here and hereafter. May this monument, whose cornerstone we are now about to deposit, stand as a memorial of the blessings and advantages that our country derived from the character and conduct of that personage whose name it is to bear, and whose virtues it is to perpetuate. May it excite in us those noble affections that will entitle us to the continuance of his favor, 
who is the author of every good and perfect gift. May we view it as a continued monitor to emulate the virtues and to follow the example of him whose character implies everything that is great. O oh, let our hearts and all that is within us praise the Lord for his goodness. Let the soldier, when he views this monument, remember that America requires he should form his character upon the model of Washington, that he should combine bravery with prudence, courage with humanity, the service of his God with the service of his country. Let the statesman here learn the important lesson that integrity is the rule by which all his plans are to be measured, honesty the scale in which all his schemes are to be weighed, that religion is the only base on which the happiness of a nation can stand secure, and that true patriotism consists in that ardent love of our country which excites to originate and promote measures to dispense the blessings of freedom, justice, and plenty among all descriptions of citizens. Let the private citizen, when he looks upon this monument, remember that it is erected in memory of a man who was an ornament to private life as well as public, who, to the bravery of a soldier and the integrity of a statesman, added the virtues of an affectionate husband, a kind neighbor, a useful citizen, and a pious Christian. O oh God, as it pleased thee to appoint the rainbow as a token that the earth should not again be destroyed by a flood, so may this monument remain as a token that America must not be deluged by sin, that the land of Washington must not be torn by faction or ruined by vice, that no domineering tyrant shall raise his head on this soil, or the happiness of our citizens be sacrificed at the shrine of ambition. To this monument let the father lead his son, and tell him that to be great he must possess the virtues and the principles of him to whose memory it is dedicated. On this monument, O oh God, may we all look as a reproof of sin, and an encouragement to virtue, as the ark of independence, the model of patriotism, and the reward of greatness. And may it be happily instrumental in inspiring our hearts with noble sentiments, in elevating our souls above mean pursuits, and in preparing us to share in the everlasting rewards of all those who love God, who trust in a Redeemer, and whose souls are adored by the noble qualities of pure Christians. These, our prayers, we offer unto thee in the name and through the merits of our blessed Redeemer, to whom, with thee and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The President, accompanied by the Board of Managers, then descended to the place where the cornerstone was suspended, and by their secretary invited His Excellency Levine Winder, right worthy Grand Master of Masons, Colonel John E. Howard, President, and General S. Smith, Vice President of the Cincinnati, and Edward Johnson, Mayor of the City of Baltimore, to witness the laying of the stone. To whom, when assembled, the President made the following address. I have, gentlemen, been required by the Board of Managers to ask your participation with them on this interesting occasion. And, worshipful sir, addressing the right worthy Grand Master, to present you with these implements, handing the square, plumb, and level, used by your ancient fraternity, with which you will be pleased to proceed and ascertain the fitness of this stone. The right worthy Grand Master replied, Honorable sir, on behalf of the free and accepted Masons of this state, I accept with pleasure your invitation and it will afford us peculiar satisfaction to render all the assistance within our power, so that the stone may be laid agreeably to the ancient usage of the order, especially as the object of the building to be erected is to hand down to the latest posterity the virtues and patriotism of the greatest of men, who, during his valuable life, honored our order by becoming a zealous and faithful member of the fraternity. His Excellency, the right worthy Grand Master, then proceeded to try the fitness of the stone, and addressing the president, pronounced the same, true and trusty. The architect, assisted by Messrs. William Stewart and Thomas Towson, the operative masons, under the direction of the president, fixed the stone in its proper position. The secretary then deposited in the stone a copper plate, and a sealed glass bottle containing a likeness of Washington, his valedictory address, the several newspapers printed in this city, and the different coins of the United States. On the stone was engraved, William Stewart and Thomas Towson, stonecutters. Sater Stevenson, stonemason. The president, accompanied by the right worthy Grand Master, 
the president and vice president of the cincinnati and the mayor of the city proceeded and settled the stone the grand master then pronounced may the great architect of the universe grant a blessing on this foundation stone which we have now laid and by his providence enable us to finish this and every other work which may be undertaken for the benefit of the republic and the perpetuity of our free institutions the right worthy grand master then received severally the vessels containing corn wine and oil and addressing the president sir as the scattering of corn and the pouring out of wine and oil on such occasions are a part of our ancient ceremonies with your assent i will perform the duty the president signified his assent when the grand master scattered the corn and poured out the wine and oil on the stone saying may the all bountiful author of nature bless this city with an abundance of corn wine and oil and with all the necessaries conveniences and comforts of life and may the same almighty power preserve this city from ruin and decay to the latest posterity the right worthy grand master then addressing the reverend john hargrove grand chaplain said have we here the first and greatest light of masonry he replied it is in my hands right worthy the right worthy grand master again asked what instructions does it give on this occasion the grand chaplain read the following selected passages from the holy writings thus saith the lord god behold i lay in zion for a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious corner stone a sure foundation judgment also will i lay to the line and righteousness unto the plummet isaiah twenty eight chapter sixteen and seventeen for behold the stone which i have laid before joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes behold i will engrave the engraving thereof with the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 3, chapter 9. Behold ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary, and bless the Lord. The Lord hath made heaven and earth. Bless thee out of Zion. Psalm 84. Grand Honors by the Masons. The President then addressed Mr. Mills. Mr. Robert Mills is a native of Charleston, South Carolina and has the honor of being the first american educated architect the managers appointed by the legislature of maryland to superintend the erection of this monument intended to hand down to the latest generation the love of country the disinterestedness the valor and the patriotism of one of the greatest and best of men that ever lived in any age having the most unbounded confidence in your skill and integrity as an architect do now entrust you with these symbols handing the square plain and level by which you are to prosecute according to that design pointing to a representation of the monument as designed by mr mills painted by mr warren a monument which may do honor to yourself as an architect as well as those who have confided in you and be in some degree commensurate with its object mr mills replied the honor sir which you have been pleased to confer upon me I hope to prove that I duly appreciate, by a faithful performance of the duties incumbent upon me as your architect, I feel a double inducement to use my best exertions to execute faithfully and with ability the important duty entrusted to me from the recollection that the work to be performed is the execution of a monument to perpetuate our country's gratitude to the father of her liberties and that you have given a preference to native genius in the choice of a design for the work the rev dr inglis then addressed the throne of divine grace as follows sovereign of nations whose throne is the only throne before which our free republic bows itself if we know our own hearts it is our delight to do the homage as our monarch our judge and our god we give thee thanks that at length the foul blot of reproach is effaced from the public name and that a splendid memorial of the people's gratitude is at length about to be reared to tell to the world that honor is due from them and shall be paid to the brave the just and the good to their chief their benefactor and their father what people has ever had such cause of gratitude to thee as this people for what people except of old for thy chosen tribes whom thou leadest through the wilderness to a land of rest of plenty prosperity and glory hast thou ever done such deeds of wonder as for these people and of all thy multitudinous blessings bestowed upon us 
we esteem it not the least that thou didst give us the achievements and the example of thine eminent servant, whose spirit is now in other worlds, but whose happy memory lives undecayingly in our affections, and to the honor of whose transcendental character this monumental fabric is devoted. Thy servant, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Thy servant, the delight of an admiring world, whose country is the universe, whose fame is eternity. We thank thee that thou didst form and adapt his mind to the crisis which called him into action, to the exigencies of the eventful times during which he exercised his exalted talents and his no less exalted virtues. For while we cherish the name and memory of our glorious chief, we humbly and thankfully acknowledge that every perfect gift, whether of goodness or of greatness, cometh down from above, from thee, O fountain of excellence, from thee, O father of lights, with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. We thank thee that this great man lived not in vain, and that his precious example has not been lost upon the people before whose eyes it shines. The wounds of those brave men who have survived the shock of recent battles on no distant field, whose patience and fortitude, under the privations and exposures of war, whose self-denial, whose contempt of danger, and whose martial ardor drove back the unsuccessful hosts of invasion to their ships, attest that the example of his valor and his patriotism has not been lost upon us. The enunciations of victory by our laureled commanders, when the blood of the brave dyed the waters of the lakes, attest that the example of his modesty and his piety has not shone upon us in vain. They attest that, like him, the intrepid leader and warrior who, with firm and faithful step, advances to the onset, forgets not, amid the pomp and circumstance of the war, that God is the Lord of hosts, to whom all might and all success are to be ascribed. On this occasion, and at this sacred spot, may we be enabled to look back with gratitude upon the past, and forward upon the future with hope, confidence, and courage. Thou who didst accomplish this unparalleled man with great gifts for war and peace, that he might go in and out before this so great people, wilt not forsake the country which gave him birth, and where his ashes lie. To thy blessing we solemnly commend its institutions and its interests. This day, the anniversary of that proud day which gave us national existence, of that glorious day when first independence thundered from the Senate Hall and scattered its lightning from the sword of the chief along the thorny and assanguated pathway, that, under the auspices of omnipotence, led in the event to victory and to peace. This day, this joyful day, we invoke thy blessing. Bless these assembled multitudes. Bless this flourishing and growing city, ever favored by thy smiles, and of late signally protected by thy providence. Bless the state of which it is the ornament, our governor and public functionaries. Bless the United States of America, united indissolubly, free and independent perpetually. God save the Republic, which himself hath formed to be the refuge of freedom. Never, O oh never, of freedom may it prove the grave. Bless the President of the United States and all in authority, and grant that, under their administration, the people may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. Sovereign of nations, author of all good, patron and rewarder of integrity, patriotism and valor, we supplicate thy benediction upon the interesting solemnity of this day, Thine to shine upon the deed which hath been done, and to accept it. For while this monumental structure shall present to the beholder the emblematic register of glory, shall it not proclaim the obligations of the Republic to him who formed her general for the field, her ruler for the cabinet? O oh, may this memorial of our dead friend and father speak in tones of deep interest to all his children. May it lead them to remember every particular of his moral, civic, and military virtue. Let the believer remember that our chief venerated the rights of religion and the name of God. Let the citizen remember that our chief bowed to the supremacy of the laws, and gloried in rendering prompt obedience to the voice of constituted authority. Let the soldier remember that our chief fought because freedom and truth and virtue and conscience armed him. That his sword would have refused to leave its scabbard in an unholy cause, and that he never could have been induced by seduction or provocation to turn its point against the maternal bosom of his country. Let successive presidents, commanders, magistrates, counselors, and all depositories of power remember that our chief sought not 
in any one instance himself, but at all times his country's weal. Save, Lord, save this fabric of the people's gratitude, this structure to the blessed memory of our national father and benefactor, consecrated by the recollections, the sensibilities, and the prayers of his children. Oh, save it from destructive casualties, protect it against the moldering touch of time, and at what period soever the clangor of arms may again disturb our peaceful pursuits, let us look upon this splendid pile. Let us ask where is the spirit of the hero whose fame it perpetuates. Let us emulate his deeds, and gather round the monument of our father. Let us guard it with no less resolved and unshrinking purpose than we would our altars and our homes. Almighty God, we believe that thou art never displeased with the expression of praise where praise is due. We, therefore, deem it becoming us on this solemn occasion to notice with tender recollection the respectable, amiable, and patriotic person to whose indefatigable labors we, of this vicinity, are chiefly indebted for the honorable privilege of laying the first monumental stone sacred to the memory of the father of his country. In all patriotic offices, in all public works for motive of the interests of truth, virtue, benevolence, and liberty, grant that his example may be universally imitated with a perseverance and enthusiasm worthy of the American citizen. Sovereign of nations, almighty creator, God of the spirits of all flesh, Father of our Savior, by whose divine permission we have united in these exercises, listen, we beseech thee, to our thanksgiving and supplications, and favorably, in much mercy, be pleased to answer them. Amen. Men, brethren, and fellow citizens, Jehovah bless thee and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Music, first solemn, then national. Grand salute of one hundred guns, the band playing a national air. The whole ceremonies of the day were concluded by three volleys from the whole line of infantry. The evening sky was beautifully bespangled by rockets thrown from the Java frigate and from the mansion of Colonel Howard in the park. They rose in a brilliant line of fire, and forming a graceful arc, broke into stars as they descended. Divine providence seemed to smile upon the occasion. The air was delightfully cool, and the firmament serene. The evening silence and tranquility that closed the joyful turbulence of the day formed a striking contrast, and seemed to display that sobriety of pleasure which the solemnity of the occasion demanded. The following is an original inscription proposed for the Washington Monument. On the fourth day of July, and in the year of the Christian era, 1815, the citizens of Baltimore laid the first foundation stone of a magnificent column sacred to the memory of George Washington, a name as revered in the cabinet as renowned in the field, a name which, to these United States of America, shall ever be as dear as it is illustrious, and which, throughout revolving ages, as the soldier, the general, and the heroic defender of his country's liberty, in fame untarnished and glory immortal, shall outlive every perishable monument. End of an authentic account of all the proceedings on the 4th of July, 1815, with regard to laying the cornerstone of the Washington Monument, now erecting in the city of Baltimore. Printed and published by John Horace Pratt. Recording by Todd.